Welcome back, everybody. I've titled this section Logical Alchemy because it's kind of strange to me that so many of us are okay and comfortable with the idea of turning false into true. And yet, if you look up any book in mathematics, logic, philosophy, you'll see that this is one of the things that's considered a logical entailment, that false should imply true. But I think this is mostly a miscommunication. I'm going to try to take us through the proper process to talk about implication. I'm not really changing the world of logic here. I'm just trying to bring out a nuance which gets under-celebrated and which will turn false into true into more of a clear description of steps and less of a leap outside of logic. Let me explain how that's going to happen. With regular alchemy, the idea was to turn straw into gold. There was no real way to do this. The chemists didn't understand this at the time. At least they had the same color. But the idea of turning true into false is a place where we're trying to give a process by which this could happen. It's not merely a rule that says false can become true, it's a set of steps. And so we really should understand where these steps are coming from, otherwise we run the risk of sounding like some kind of medieval scholar with a pseudo-understanding of chemistry. Let's see what we can do with that. Remember, what we're going to do to describe any kind of logical operation is we're going to give it three basic steps, which as a mnemonic I'm using the lie paradigm. I'll have to specify the language I want to use, then I'll have to specify what the introductions for the rule are and what the elimination are. And the symbol I'll be using has an arrow to it. It's a common symbol for implication. And so we'll get into how this works. I'll start with the language. The language is pretty common to our usual speech. We say if something rather than something or other all the time. Not every use of those words is the meaning of implication, however, and we'll get into the meaning of that as we see some of the slides. But let's take a sentence like the following. If x is greater than or equal to y, then x squared is greater than or equal to y squared. Quick warning, I am not declaring that that's always true. I'm simply stating a conditional sentence. This is the kind of sentence that I want to talk about. It has this hypothesis that x greater than or equal to y, and a conclusion, x squared greater than or equal to y squared. Whether it's not true or false is something we would have to judge after we've stated the question. Now, we can take away the words if and then and replace it with symbols. A very common choice for symbols is this little double arrow symbol. This is very common in logic circles and in mathematics. But it's not the only symbol. Some of the other symbols that you might encounter include a sort of U-shaped sideways like this, or you might see just a single arrow pointing into space. These are all different ways that people give the same idea, but just with symbolic notation. I want to set aside things that really do qualify in this space, but we're too soon to get there. For example, an if-then in a computer program. If I say if x is greater than or equal to y, then, I'm not typically in a program expecting to have another statement, another truth value. Instead, I'm expecting the program to now take some actions based on this decision. So this would be a stage in which the conditional is telling me how to operate. I go into a flowchart and I move left to right, depending on the choices of the data. We'll come back to that. It has a lot to do with if then else, but right now we're going to focus on just value adjustments. Is something true or is it false? And there are some rule breakings to keep in mind. Even if we stick with words, or maybe perhaps especially when we use words, the way that we present conditionals can be a little bit messy. For example, the sentence we have already could have been rewritten x squared is greater than or equal to y if x is greater than or equal to y. Again, I'm not saying that's true, I'm saying how we could state the sentence. Other ways to encounter this would be something like, when x is greater than y, it follows that x squared is greater than or equal to y squared. You can become somewhat comfortable with the idea of replacing if, when, and because, because they all work in a similar linguistic way. Of course, the English language is very subtle, and it could actually introduce different meanings, so read carefully. All their alternatives are then, implies, follows, and thus. You'll see as you work through many examples, there's really no reason to memorize them, just read the whole sentence. And when in doubt, use a symbol that doesn't change. So if we summarize our language at this point, we need to write down a grammar. But before we do that, I want to point out that these very important changes can happen to make the language say something that it doesn't mean. What we give now is an explanation of an example with an if, and it's very common in mathematics as well. This isn't just narrowly applied inside of, say, um, English language. It has to do with the difference between a definition and an implication. A triangle is equilateral if all its sides have equal length. This could be a statement that's a conditional. If somebody had already explained equilateral in some way, then I would have to prove to you that having all equal sides makes the triangle equilateral. However, 
In our situation, the word equilateral is being defined by the property of having all its sides of equal length. That's what equilateral means. So here we're not actually entailing any power to the word equilateral. We're simply using it as a shorthand for a longer phrase. This is a definition, not a conditional, not an implication. Over here we have this part of the sentence, this clause, is the thing we're trying to abbreviate, and we're abbreviating it with the term triangle is equilateral, okay? If you're not sure what a definition is, it's really just a substitution of one name or terms or symbols for something that might take a lot more to write down. If I say x is defined as the square root of 17 to log 1541, I obviously don't want to carry around all those data and make a slight typo. It's easier to just use the number x. So just think of this as replacement, not if and only if. So now let's jump ahead to the elimination rule. If it rains, then the ground is wet. Well, this might be true in some circumstances. And if it does rain, then I would therefore think that the ground is wet. That's a pretty straightforward argument. The things above the red line are our premises. It's actually several of them. We'll see that one of them is right here. We can see that it rained is what premise. And the other premise is if it rains, then the ground is wet. It's only together that these two separate premises conclude with are therefore the ground is wet. That's the nature of the kind of argument that an implication can provide for us. Let's see what that looks like in symbols. If we were to name the running pieces, we would see that one of the pieces of data is that it rained. It rained is necessary to get this whole thing going. That's this P right here. We also see that the rain appears in the if part. So that's why it appears twice, but it's playing two different roles. Down here is a conclusion that it did actually rain. Up here, it's a conditional. What if it does rain? Once we get that it rained, we go to the ground is wet. That's the cue we see here. So given the conditions that when it rains, the ground is wet, and it rained, we conclude that the ground is wet. So there are two premises working together to make a conclusion. Well, it's slightly more subtle than that. Why do we believe that when it rains, the ground is wet? When we say that, we're making some assumptions about the context. Take, for example, the context of an indoor baseball stadium. If there's a roof and it rains, the ground is not wet. So this statement at the beginning would not be valid. But if it was an outdoor stadium, then when it rains, the ground would be wet. And this is the nature of a context. So we need to add the context to the story. And so now we see that with the context added, we can consult the context to describe why we think it's true that P implies Q. Without the context, we shouldn't believe it at all. It's a statement that is neither valid nor invalid. We don't know enough to know. Now, often the reason we don't write this in is because we assume everyone in our story has the same common context, the same assumptions. So we leave it as what we knew as implicit context. But for this lesson, I want to be very careful to point out the context is part of this storyline. Otherwise, everything falls apart, and we lead to weird impressions like the alchemy of logic that false can lead to true. The context is going to clear up what that is about. The second thing we need from context is that it actually rained. We fulfilled the conditions of the conditional, and that's how we got to the conclusion. So with that structure of the argument, let's turn to the next part of the story, which is how to make a conclusion. So the introduction law for implication. Let's take this story. If x is greater than or equal to y, then x squared is greater than or equal to y squared. You might try this with some numbers. 5 is greater than 3. 5 squared is 25. 3 squared is 9. That seems to hold up. So let's see if we can prove it. Our context? Well, let's take natural numbers, the counting numbers 0, 1, 2, and whatever else. Now we need to think about what it means in that context for n to be greater than n. One of the many possible meanings is that if we add to n, we'll get to m. Notice that if 3 was greater than 5, you could add nothing to 5 to get to 3, except a negative number. Natural numbers not having negatives make that impossible. So this is just the right definition for the numbers we're talking about. In this context, the bigger number will only be reached by another added number. So we get the right definition. Therefore, we have the premise. The premise that we're trying to think about, the p, is that x is greater than or equal to y. And given that we're dealing with natural numbers, that means that there is a k that supplements n to get all the way to m. And now we look for an implication. We want to move from the assumption at the beginning to the conclusion. I'm going to do it with arithmetic. 
Using these arithmetic steps, I see that I just replace m with its value n plus k. And since m squared is what I'm interested in, to match this x squared, I look at two copies of m, which are now two copies of n plus k. I do a bit of arithmetic, and I reorganize my information. Notice I'm throwing away a lot of information and just calling it j, and that's simply to simplify my thinking. By writing it as j, I see that it's analogous to this plus k, which if I look in my context, allows me to say a less than or equal to sign. So what I see is that the m squared must be greater than or equal to the n squared because it's equal to n squared plus some more. That's exactly what the greater than or equal to sign was about. So what have I achieved by this little argument? What I've done is I've taken the premise and I've shown through reasonable arguments, logical deductions, that this is true. That is its premise of its own. The premise could be thought of as Q being M squared greater than or equal to N from P, M greater than or equal to N. So the whole thing taken together is a process to claim the following. We are stating that given the context of natural numbers and given the assumption that M is greater than or equal to N, then m squared is greater than or equal to n squared. That's what we've just concluded. So as our rule for introduction, we are saying that given p leading to q, we should might as well just call that p implies q. Remember the role of introduction is simply to give a label to whatever's happened above in our proof. It's trying to give us a short, compact way of describing a sequence of logical arguments. The logical arguments in here took the flavor of arithmetic. Whatever the argument is, we're hiding it behind the single arrow. We are introducing the symbol to simplify our reasoning. It lets us worry about the order of the logic instead of the details of the proof. That's the nature of this introduction rule. But now, can you spot what's missing? If you said context, you're right. We need context to be true. Let's look at this expression one more time. x is greater than or equal to y, and x squared is greater than or equal to y squared. What if we plug in negative 3 and negative 4? Well, negative 3 squared is 9, which is not greater than 16, which is negative 4 squared. So what happened here? The answer was we changed the context. Context absolutely matters with implication. The implication we just proved was in the context of natural numbers, counting numbers that are non-negative. We've now changed the context, and the implication no longer seems valid. And without knowing that, we could really gum up what we're trying to say to each other. Context matters. So what? let's wrap this up in this way. The natural numbers gave us the implication. If x is greater than or equal to y, then x squared is greater than or equal to y squared. In the integers, that isn't true. We just found an example. So what we really are saying is that given a context gamma, we can add that alongside our premise. It's both of these together that are leading to Q. It's not P implying Q on its own. It's P and gamma together giving us Q. And sometimes that can make all the difference. The result is, when we're done saying that the implication at the beginning began and depended on the context, it means that the conclusion also depends on the context. You can't say that P implies Q just flat out. It's not true that X greater than or equal to Y implies X squared greater than or equal to Y squared. But in the context that you have it, it might be true, like the natural numbers. Change the context, it may no longer be an implication. Keep the role of the context in mind. It messes with your mind if you don't. So let me summarize the lie rules that we have for implication. You could use if then else, but we have other types of grammar as well. So if then else is the grammar where we put the terms here and an next term here, and that'll be our implication. Other times we use a symbol like an equal sign with an arrow to make it look like a typed arrow, computer programs like that. And other times in mathematics, we make a nice little font between them. Whether you like the arrows or words, it's up to you. Our elimination rule, the classic version, is modus ponens. This is a naive version. We're going to see implication in a future video where we see more nuance. What does it need when it's paraconsistent, for example, or other situations in logic? And the introduction rule similarly depends on a context and P leading to Q, and then you can say P implies Q. So let's go back to this logical alchemy. How do we turn false into true? This feels like it shouldn't happen. It feels like it's illogical. It makes you wonder if you're really going to trust the mathematics that you're using. I claim it comes down to vagueness in how we word things. If pigs can fly, then pigs can get bird flu. 
But what's the nature of this sentence? Is it valid or invalid? The statement that pigs can fly is totally false. Pigs do not fly, but pigs can get bird flu. And so this is a valid statement, but how? Well, the situation is this. The false premise is going to the true conclusion, but the way it's doing it is by context. Context is what really makes pigs get bird flu. Pigs flying isn't responsible for the bird flu. It's the context. Remember, we have gamma and P together are going to give us the entailment of Q. That's how we introduce an implication. So this is a situation where the important information is not coming from P, but rather gamma is producing Q. It is true that in our current world, there are types of bird flu that a pig can get. And that context, gamma, the current world we have, is giving a reason to believe in Q. P is just along for the ride. It's irrelevant to this conclusion. So you could, in principle, have just dismissed the P. It's just there as extra data. And in fact, if you go to classical logic and intuitionistic logic, recall that we had a few extra tools that could lead to anything in Q. If P was even false, false was allowed to lead to anything. That was the law of explosion. It's not required to make this argument, but the point is that you could have a logic in which you get to get Q even from a false P by a logical rule, not by any deep thought, but simply the law of explosion might have been part of your context. Again, it still comes back to context that entails everything you need to have happen. So if we put this together, this is the better way to think about what's happening with implication. It's not technically wrong, but it's misleading to say that a false premise leads to a true conclusion because it's never a false premise on its own. It's a context together with a false premise that leads to a true conclusion. And in this case, it's the context that makes true Q in the first place. The only reason we would know true about Q was if something else had proven Q was true. So that something else could only have come from the rest of the premises, and the rest of the premises are just the context. So false never comes to true. It's false plus stuff you chose to ignore. The stuff you chose to ignore is responsible for the truth. And that restores the logical order to what we say. There really isn't logical alchemy. There's just vagueness in how we state our logic. So in summary, false doesn't really imply true, but context often does imply true. And that's how we can explain that even a false premise might still lead to a true conclusion because the false premise is not the only thing that's leading to the conclusion. It's the context and the false premise. There's still many things we need to do with implication. We haven't quite discerned whether we think of things intuitionistically, classically, paraconsistently, linear logic, there's resource counting, there's lots of things to explore. But we've got on the board a symbol with the right rules that we can now tease out the subtleties that we'll need. Until next time.